So we're live on air. I feel like I'm on the radio or on the television welcoming Eva Professor, Dr. Eva Wiese. Sorry, I'm always forgetting either either one. So it's Professor Dr. Wiese. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to yes, welcome you to our event here at iSquare today. And I think Karina already introduced both of us. Mm -hmm. So I will maybe add one or two more points of context, but um, yeah. Too bad it didn't didn't work out live, but this is also great, and I hope our um, participants and attendees of the of the conference will yeah they have a lot of questions coming up. I will I will do my best to answer some of them. <laughs> <That's very good. laughs> mm -hmm. And yes, of course we also welcome you to Berlin in in the virtual way now, but that's that's fine. So we we hear that you are moving to Berlin. You're teaching in Berlin already, and. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, of course, for us a great honor since a lot of us actually studied at the Technical University. Mm -hmm. And I think Michael did, I did, Stefan, yes, there's, there's quite a few. And of course, the Human Factors Program mm -hmm. um, is also something that a lot of us know since basically the students are very welcome as well at, at mm -hmm. iSquare. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe you can give us some context also from your, your new job now in Berlin and also the, the job you're, you left in, what's it, George Mason, right? GM, mm -hmm. no, what's, what's, the, what's the shortcut? George Mason University, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, I'm uh, uh, grateful for the invitation. It's always good, you know, if uh, academia and, and industry meet at some point. Um, yeah, my name is Eva Wiese. I got my PhD in neuroscience, so I'm actually, on the, one would say the opposite end of the spectrum of applied research originally, a PhD in neuroscience from the LMU in Munich. Um, and then I went to George Mason University, which is a pretty big state university uh, in um, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. um, I have never heard of that university before, before I started there, but it turns out it's uh, the, they have the best human factors program in the United States. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with Raja Parasuraman, one of the founding fathers of human factors, for a few years until he unfortunately passed away. Uh, and I was assistant professor there for eight, for six years, assistant professor, and then for two years, associate professor, mm -hmm. until I accepted the offer for full professorship at TU Berlin. And I started there officially in February, but mm -hmm. because of COVID, I'm still physically mm -hmm. in the United States, but virtually already at Technical University. And uh, there um, I'm the, I have the professorship for cognitive psychology and cognitive ergonomics. Great, great. Thanks for the introduction. I'm always trying to step in the, also the, the seats, let's say, of our, of our attendees and, Yes, of course, ergonomics, I guess a lot of them heard already, but maybe maybe you could give us a little more background of, of what your field of research is. So mm -hmm. where your specialization is and and yeah, what you did at the George Mason and mm -hmm. also, of course, what you'll do in, in Berlin. I know you're, of course, teaching. So that's also interesting for, for us, what, what you're teaching, since mm -hmm. some of the topics will probably come back and touch, touch later on. But um, yeah. yeah. And maybe, you can... and maybe I start with the teaching part because the mm -hmm. research part I will probably speak uh, a little more about. Um, teaching, I uh, teach cognitive psychology for master's students. And then we have two modules, one on usability and product design, um, which has two sections. One is cognitive ergonomics and one is usability and UX. Um, and then the other one is um, specialization topics in cognitive psychology. And there I teach um, human machine interaction and topics related to human machine interaction, such as human robot interaction, human robot teaming, trust in automation, and these kinds of things. And then on the undergraduate level, which is actually a very fun course, I teach uh, cognitive uh, psychology for engineers. So that's uh, where you can really still impress people with very basic psychological effects that other like psychologists just find boring and engineers find super exciting. 
what would what would that be like in effect try try to bore us <laughs> like you mean something like visually the strobe effect like an interference okay. effect for instance this is still something when you ask somebody in class to try it out uh, where they are still fascinated because they initially think it's not a problem and then when one of them tries it and they realize oh it's really hard um it's fun to see when okay. they are really excited and impressed i see okay so it's not as easy to to impress the master students then i guess anymore no not that easy <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's the same a little bit for us right so we can't yeah. impress our clients as easily anymore with a system one or two right um or a visual let's say um yeah, visual tricks and mm -hmm. and inattentional blindness or something, but we maybe we'll get get to the attention part later on a little bit as well. And mm -hmm. um, so when I when I um, looked on your webpage, I also read about the social and cognitive interaction lab. So is that yeah. basically your specialization then? Mm -hmm. That is my main research focus. So. Um, when I did my PhD in Munich, uh, that project was financed by an excellence cluster called Cognitive, uh, Cognition in Technical Systems. And there the main focus was really to apply cognitive theories to the design of social robots. And the question was, how can you design robots that people want to intuitively interact with? And some groups did research on non-social robots and um, my group, I was within the psychology department, we did uh, research on social robots. And so that's one area that I, that I, that's still my main area of uh, research. And then the other one is called extended cognition, or some people call it embodied cognition. And that's how, uh, like trying to understand how people incorporate their environment into their cognitive decision making where you know cognitive psychology originally always thought all of our cognitive processes are going on inside of our head but it has been shown that that's actually not true even our emotional states are represented in you know muscle activity when we for instance understand try to understand emotional states of others we see you can record mass muscle activity from the uh, respective muscles when you show the same facial expressions and that's actually one thing that our brain is really good at simulating things as if we were doing them ourselves when you see them in others to understand what's the underlying cause or what's the underlying internal state and I'm trying to apply this theory of embodied cognition to human technology interaction where mm -hmm. the main idea is um in terms of task allocation, what are people willing to outsource to technology? Um, what tasks would they rather do themselves? Do they know when they are bad at a certain task? And do they understand when the machine is good at a certain task? And do they actually, in a very rational, smart way, allocate the shared human machine resources across the human machine team, essentially? Cool, cool. Yeah, I actually had the question of embodied cognition since it's a very interesting topic and I couldn't really explain it myself since I still think all my cogn cognitive processes are actually inside my head. But um, what would be like a everyday example, like like the for an embodied cognition, how could I outsource the cognition? I still have problems <laughs> imagining mm -hmm. like like the technology actually, like like a smartphone or right what, what i mean a navigation tool is the the easiest uh, or a navigation device is the best example where it is something that we have a really hard time with because it requires 3D modeling of the environment or in the worst case, you look at a 2D map, you need to map this into your 3D environment and then update the entire time where you are res with respect to what you see into this in this 2D representation. And that's obviously bad because it costs a lot to change between your internal co uh, computation or to switch mm -hmm. between your internal computation and what you see in reality. And so this is what we are really bad at. So if we have a device that kind of anticipates uh, what we are bad at and tries to show it to us okay. in a way that in the best way maps our internal model, is a good example where you can use insights from embodied cognition or extended cognition to design technology better so that those switch costs mm -hmm. between internal and external are minimized. Cool, I understand, thanks. And um, 
So basically, when you talk about also the, yeah, the social part and robotics, mm-hmm. what, what do you mean? Like, does it mean like the robots like show emotions or are they just smarter mm-hmm. and reading, reading my emotions and mm-hmm. attention and all these processes? Or mm-hmm. I mean, with regard to human-robot interaction, the examples are even more intuitive, I would say, because they, it really gets down to basic... Um, social interaction cues is how we call it in, in, in cognitive psychology, where you just need to first, you, you, you try to use what we know from human human interaction and apply it to human robot interaction. Right. And when you talk about social robots, the challenge is how can you design this social element? So we all know about user experience and all in usability and to how to make how to improve the functional part and even the experience part uh, of human technology interaction. But the social part is something that there is not really, there there are no Nielsen and Norman guidelines to tell you how to make a machine social and under what conditions you actually want that to happen, right? So so for instance, and then we we go to human-human interaction and see what are the hallmarks there? How do we know how friends interact with each other versus how a human interacts with a stranger. How does it look different? What are the different cues here? Mm-hmm. And, and one thing, for instance, when coming back to embodied cognition that you see often in friends is that they imitate each other or mirror each other for, for no reason other than showing affection and signs of social connection. And that, you know, I'm sure everybody has experienced that where you ha- see yourself doing the weirdest things in terms of body manipulations, doing things with your hair, your eyebrows, whatever, yeah, just because well. you observe it in <laughs> somebody else. Um, and we call that perception and action coupling. And that has to do with the fact that uh, what we perceive and what we do is not completely independent, in particular in social interactions. There's a, an, an effect that's called motor interference, where you are asked, for instance, to make a, a, a vertical arm movement, and then you observe either the same movement in somebody else standing opposite of you, or you observe an orthogonal movement, like horizontal in this case, um, and you're supposed to make a straight line. And the interesting thing is that if the person who is opposite of you, uh, if the person makes the uh, orthogonal movement, you have more noise in your movement. You can try as hard as you like, but as long as you have your eyes open and observe that movement, it has a negative impact on the execution of your own action. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is that with robots, you don't necessarily see that immediately. And that has to do with the fact that we don't treat them as full social interaction partners. Mm-hmm. And also because they don't move the same way as humans do. So they don't trigger that mechanism to the same okay. extent. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I wish, I wish I had the chance then to, to meet one of the more social robots Robots, soon, but but maybe we we do get the chance then if you mm-hmm. also bring them to Berlin with you and um... there will be forty five robots of oh. all sizes of all social uh, appearance hopefully okay. at some point when I am there and uh, I get the chance to to order yeah. them so, yeah, we're looking forward to maybe record them then as well but um so the perception part I think it's it's also very interesting I mean the the social cognition and um, the whole research, I guess, like you mm-hmm. use all of these neuro me- methods in your everyday mm-hmm. research life, like from, yeah. mm-hmm. from the very like, yeah. complicated ones to the easier ones as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, as I said, my, my background is in neuroscience. So mm-hmm. I initially did not intend to really do applied research, uh, but I found it very interesting and that um, robots trigger somewhat similar brain activation, but not completely overlapping brain activation when you compare it to human-human interaction. So mm-hmm. over, over time, uh, what we found helpful is to really look at brain activation when people interact with robots and see if they activate similar brain areas as if humans interact with humans. Because there is something that's called the social brain network. And that is um, a system that you that is very um, significant or very um, unique to primates, human and non-human primates. 
And, and it's really mainly activated when we engage in social interactions with mm -hmm. entities that are similar to us. And the interesting thing that, that I and some others have found is that when you interact with robots, you do see some of the same behaviors. So mm -hmm. people are able to interact with robots socially, but the brain activation looks more like as if they were solving a math problem. Okay. So they so so interacting with robots engages more analytical brain areas, whereas engaging socially on the same task with human humans activates more this social brain network. And so the idea is to really use this insight to change the design and the behavior of robots and to see that what what you have to change in robot appearance and behavior so that the brain activation in human robot interaction resembles more the brain activation of human human interaction. Okay. okay, interesting. So it's a lot of understanding how our yeah information processing works. And so we're very glad to have you here as an expert for that too. And mm -hmm. yeah, like I mean now you haven't heard Michael's talk before, but um, yeah, we gave you a small intro as well. But um, when we as applied researchers talk a lot about perception and attention and mm -hmm. also about you know attention economy and now we basically talk a lot about the implicit and um, also the system zero that Michael already explained before um, how, how important are these yeah let's say very early processes that are maybe conscious maybe not yet conscious also for for your research I mean some of the um the effects that I have described already, the perception and action coupling, these mm -hmm. things usually when you ask people, they can't report them consciously. So they they do some of that doesn't reach our level of, of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So people don't know that they are influenced by that. Or um, you can, there are studies where uh, participants have to send in their photos and then they before the experiment and, mm -hmm. and then we morph their photos into photos of robots and then show them pictures of a robot that has let's say five percent of their own <laughs> image in it and then you just ask them how much they like the robot or you mm -hmm. look at interaction duration and you find that people interact for longer with robots that have five percent of themselves <laughs> in the <laughs> robot um, but but if you ask them explicitly, mm -hmm. do you think that the robot looks like you? They say, no, no way, this is a robot. So um, this is a clear example for me how um, it is a pre-attentive process really because people can't explicitly recognize that, mm -hmm. that certain things influences their influence their behavior, but it clearly has an impact both on subjective ratings and also on their behavior okay. and their likability okay. uh, how much they like the agent and stuff like that interesting yeah and like for our participants as well like when we a lot of times talk about perception but then again we talk about attention and since we do applied research we sometimes forget to really define these constructs i don't want to ask you not to define them because <laughs> we're not in one of your lectures now but um but um when it comes to perception like the it's a very broad concept right and mm -hmm. the attention of course we at i square we focus a lot on on the visual attention like which like from the perception and attention part which of all of these facets of attention is the one that you are like mostly spending time with i know there's like spatial attention and of course there's the different senses and it's, mm -hmm. it's such a major yeah let's say part of our brain that it's just processing these all these information mm -hmm. But which one is then almost challenging or the one that you spend a lot of time with? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's it's the interaction between attention and working memory. Mm -hmm. So uh, in social interactions, what do people pay attention to? And um, my dissertation was on what's called social cues. So that's changes mm -hmm. in head direction, gaze direction, changes of facial expression in the combination of all of these cues. And what has been shown is that when robots show these cues, people pay, first of all, less attention to them. So they don't okay. seem to be socially salient or as socially salient to them as if those cues came from human faces. Mm -hmm. And then it does impact spatial attention also, because when a human looks to the side, you shift your attention to where the human is looking. I'm sure we have yeah. all experienced that, you know, yeah. you walk through the park, somebody is looking up 
and then we all look up because we can't help but intuitively wonder is there something interesting there <laughs> and when a robot does that it doesn't work that intuitively so i'm looking at these things so social attention is is what that that concept is called and then also do you have to spend more working memory capacity on processing these cues uh, when it's display when they are displayed on non-human agents and does that negatively impact your performance when you do a task together with a non-human agent mm -hmm. so it kind of always brings us back to our limited processing capacities and um, mm -hmm. i mean that's something we also of course always try to remember and also explain to our colleagues and, and clients that we shall always design our experiments in a way that we and our products and yeah. and the advertisements and think okay there is a limited capacity and how, how does that influence you i mean all of us i guess it does so you said like our attention is limited but also our memory right our so working memory everything is kind of limited mm -hmm. yeah and, and I mean, with human yeah. robot interaction, the interesting thing is also that you see these bottom up and top down influences on attention really um, influence each other, where um, top, I've done these studies, as I said, on social cues and often robot faces are simpler than human faces and robots have ginormous eyes compared to robot he uh, human heads. Mm -hmm. And so from a bottom up perspective, a robot changing gaze direction is more salient. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a stronger bottom up cue. So from that perspective, you would predict that people shift their attention more strongly to where the robot is looking. But then you have these top down influences that come from knowing that it's not a human, it not being similar to you, assuming that uh, or you assuming that a robot doesn't have intentions because it's not an agent with a mind and therefore a social cue coming from a robot can't mean anything um, meaningful. And so what, what my research really shows is that in human robot interaction, these top down influences have a much stronger impact actually when predicting performance and predicting okay you know, attention uh, than these bottom up cues, which from a design perspective is obviously a little challenging because what you have there is that you as a designer of robot faces essentially try to compete with people's pre-existing assumptions about robots. And then when you measure these two things in interaction in a 30 minute experiment, then you measure nothing but bias because you, 30 minutes of interaction with a robot is not enough for those bottom-up cues to kind of convince you that all of your existing assumptions about robots that you had over the <laughs> okay. last years yeah, were wrong and that this robot behaves in this particular manner that you can experience in this particular interaction. So that's really interesting to see. So it's essentially you're, you're fighting a stereotype here, the, okay. the machine stereotype. Um, and it's interesting to see how difficult that actually is uh, from a design perspective. Cool. So the, the bottom-up processes are basically also the processes that evolution kind of gave us, right? So, mm -hmm. as, um, so they are very fast and very, very automatic. And mm -hmm. um, so in a way, also similar to the System Zero now, of course, Michael, <laughs> would maybe maybe disagree but it kind of goes in that direction and um so when when we talk about these early attention process maybe you can also give us a little bit of a of your theory um from the top of your head um so how does our attention really work i know science is, is still mm -hmm. looking at it a lot like where will we look next how how are our saccades and fixations kind of being predicted and um mm -hmm um these these attention processes i mean they're also connected like you said to our memory like how does it how does it kind of work we get right. a lot of attention in and then our brain does the magic trick or well what you get in first is a lot of perception so it, mm -hmm. essentially how information enters your system is through what's called sensory memory and that's a system that um is has no capacity limits. So essentially anything that you can perceive at a given point in time gets into that system. But it has a very short duration. So not more than a second. 
So that means because otherwise that would perception alone would take up all of our brain capacity if we had to, you know, keep all of the perceptual input that we can perceive active for a longer period of time would really destroy all of our uh, processing capacities. And so that's what what I think most psychologists would call as like at the early steps of perception, that's the unfiltered short storage, very short, short storage of what you could possibly perceive. Mm -hmm. And then you already get first influences of top down uh, mechanisms where attention, I mean, the, the general assumption in psychology is, is that attention is your filter that then goes through mm -hmm. all of that information that could potentially be relevant for you. And that that zooms in on what's currently most important to you. And that can be but that can be based on very different things that that is usually determined by task demands. So if you're searching for the checkout button in an e-commerce platform, you probably look in the right upper corner first because your top down uh, knowledge tells you that is where it usually is located. And I'm sure you have data on that and can tell your clients you know, how, how yeah. high the costs are if you move that somewhere else. somewhere else. And that has to do with the fact that we we are our brain is a hypothesis driven machine and we never just process the world based on bottom up features. Things can, so you always have this competition between bottom up and top down mm -hmm. where the stimulus itself. So in psychology, you would say the bottom up features are the stimulus properties, mm -hmm. something like color, or if it blinks, or if it's oriented differently than anything else mm -hmm. uh, in the visual field, these things, per se have an impact on how salient something is for you. And that has an impact. So the most salient object is the most likely to attract attention. But then on the other hand, you have these top-down influences where knowing about the world. So for instance, if you look for the sun, you mm -hmm. wouldn't look at the bottom of the, you know, of a, an image or something like that, because you know the sun is in the sky. So these things can be so strong that they can override something that is mm -hmm. extremely salient. Also, if you are highly focused and your working memory capacity is very strongly focused on the task itself, it can happen that you don't see something, that you don't notice something that's right there in front of you. And I think you mentioned it earlier, that's called inattentional blindness. Right, so right. something can be in the focus of your attention, but you still don't see it because you're so focused on one other thing in your attentional focus that you don't have the capacities to actually actively notice that. Mm -hmm. So that's happens. where the working memory comes in. Uh -huh. So these all these systems, when you look at older models, they are they, it always looks like, okay, they are all compartmentalized and they are all isolated and information goes through it from where, one way to the other, but that's not the most current view in, in cognitive psychology. All of these okay. systems are dynamically connected and there are all sorts of feedback loops and very complex higher order cognitive processes can influence very early cognitive processes, even pre-attentive processes um, very strongly. Thank you. And um, yeah, maybe to, like as a, as a last question, when you, when you say like this always top down and bottom up and I know we of course talk a lot about our smartphones these days and when I'm like really lost and just scrolling through the smartphone I mean I kind of feel like I'm maybe zapping or watching tv but I don't feel like my top down processes or my <laughs> prefrontal cortex is very active is that is that true or do you still think it's it's always still there or is it just bottom up me scrolling through through the feed I mean, probably not very strongly top, uh, bottom up, uh, not very strongly mm -hmm. top down modulated at that point. <laughs> I mean, it has kind of a calming element. It's kind of a repetitive task. It's almost a little bit like mindfulness because you are going through and it's repetitive mm -hmm. and you have full control okay. over it. Yeah. It's more like a motor task than influencing your, your attentional resources. There, it's more interesting that certain things can still immediately capture your attention uh, from a bottom up uh yeah, based yeah, on a bottom-up yeah. principle Where because kind of they're like salient wake up because they're salient just for me i guess or they were just very good match for me and why is it so difficult then to still leave this mm -hmm. yeah, infinity loop yeah there? because attention is this thing that it's hard to 
it's hard you have to direct it and so the 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 other side of the coin is you have to disengage it also so these are the two things attentional capture is what you want when you want people to pay attention to something that's important mm -hmm. and then attentional disengagement is what you need in order to switch from one thing to the other so if you're on your phone scrolling you have a problem with attentional disengagement rather than with attentional capture okay okay so it's it's still human i guess so that's that's fine but intentional disengagement is sounds sounds like an interesting concept too and i think we also in a way have to dis disengage from you i know there would be a lot of questions and i also still have a few questions here on my list but um you're busy as as i know and yeah we don't want to keep you too long but certainly say thank you again and yeah, the round of applause now is for you virtual <laughs> and um yeah we'd be very happy to also invite you again or maybe we'll just kind of visit you in your lab when all the robots are there and yes from from the iSquare side and also from from our visitors we definitely wish you the best thank and you a safe trip to berlin <laughs> and yeah I'm, i'm sure now you'll have to go to your lectures as well and, and teaching and yeah we wish you all the best at the technical university thank you very much thank you for having me yeah, our pleasure thank you